The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to this um, Chem Careers webinar on careers in regulatory affairs. My name is Julie Franklin and I'm one of the um, careers specialists here at the Royal Society of Chemistry and I have to say that regulatory affairs is a question that we get asked very often um, by, by members. Um, how to get into it, what does it involve, it's a very popular thing that people think about. So I hope today we will be able to um, answer some of your questions and maybe demystify regulatory affairs a little bit. So just what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we go, I've, I've got three wonderful panellists who I'm going to introduce to you in a minute or two and between us we hope to go through what regulatory affairs is all about, um, how to get into careers in regulatory affairs. We're going to look at what regulatory affairs professionals do on a day-to-day -day basis and how careers can progress. We're also, very importantly, going to be looking at essential skills. So obviously your qualifications are one thing, but I'm sure our guests today will tell you that there's an awful lot more to being a successful mm -hmm. RA professional than just your qualifications. And um, we're going to talk about what support you can get from the RSC and also from TOPRA, um, who is the professional body for the regulatory affairs profession. We've got somebody on the panel um, from that regulatory body and you can get, we've got a lot of members in common. So we're going to talk about the support you can get from both bodies. Then questions and answers from you who are listening. Then we'll summarise and um, give you some further information and contacts if you're interested in finding out more. So our panel today, we're really very, very lucky indeed. Um, we have three very illustrious uh, regulatory affairs professionals today to talk to you. And the first is Sinead Whelan, who is head of membership at TOPRA. Would you just like to say hello, Sinead? Hello, yes, I'm Sinead and I'm the Head of Membership from TOPRA, which is the um, Membership Association for Regulatory Affairs Professionals. Um, and I've been uh, working with TOPRA for the past two years. Um, and in addition to that, working with other membership bodies and professional bodies for over a decade. OK, and the RSC is one of those. So we're always very grateful to, uh, to have support from Sinead. Um, our second guest today is Angela. Director for Global Regulatory Consulting and also the current president of TOPRA, I believe, Angela. Would you like to say hello? Indeed, yes. So I'm Angela Stokes. Um, I have about 28 years experience um, in um, regulatory affairs in the industry. For I started off, though, as an analytical chemist. Um, I'm a, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and also a fellow of TOPRA. Um, I work currently for a contract research organization um, looking really at regulatory affairs of drugs and devices and providing um, expertise in that area. And as you quite rightly say, I'm, a, I'm president this year of the Organization for Professionals in Regulatory Affairs. That's great. Thank you very much. And our third guest today is Carol Prested, who is Regulatory Affairs Manager for GE Healthcare. So, Carol, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I've um, I've been working in the pharma industry for the last 40 years. Uh, 30 of that has been in regulatory affairs. Um, I've worked for all kinds of uh, companies um, doing different types of regulatory work during that time. At the moment, I work for GE Healthcare and we do radio pharmaceutical diagnostics at the moment. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> OK, that, that's quite enough. OK, thank you very much. So there's an awful lot of knowledge on the panel, um, practical and, and otherwise here. Um, let's have a look at what regulatory affairs actually is. Um, Carol sent me this definition. It's the interface between the pharmaceutical company and the governmental regulatory agencies across the world that are responsible for ensuring acceptable, safe, efficacy and quality of medicine. So I think that's fairly self-explanatory, but is there anything you'd like to, to say to that, Carol, to, to put it in context for us? Yes, I, th I think it's um, I, I think it's probably no surprise to most people that um, before you can put uh, a medicinal product on the market, that you have to have p a permission from the local um, uh, government agency um, to, to be able to to actually to actually market this product, 
And in order to get the, the necessary permissions, we have to demonstrate to the government that the product is safe for people to take, that it works, that it does what it says on the tin, and that it's of a reproducible and uh, suitable quality um, for people. And if you're in regulatory affairs, obviously you there's some quite a lot of li liaison goes on with the agencies, and it is, is your job to work with your experts within your company on the various <clears throat> areas and to advise them on um, what they need to provide to the agencies. And at the same time, if the agencies have questions about your product, then you will help to field those questions and go back to your experts within the company. OK, that's great. So it's a wide ranging role. Um, we're going to look a little bit more in detail. Um, this, this, Angela, you, you submitted. So, so would you just like to go through what regulatory affairs is in, in, in your view? Yes, so, so, yes, so similarly to Carol, um, regulatory affairs really is licensing, marketing and legal compliance of a pharmaceutical and medicinal product or, or, or a device in that in this um, sense. Um, and it's, it's basically about um, combining science with the legal aspects, with business, with statistics, being able to discuss um, your product. Um, devising a strategy to register these products because we start with these products that may be a concept or maybe a powder in a vial and we're looking at that point of what does that powder in a vial do and how is the best way to get that on the market and that's what regulatory affairs is about it's about getting that powder in a vial onto the market as quickly as possible with the least cost but ensuring that you have a safe product um, as Carol's already alluded to, there is a very big liaison role between research, production, business development, um, and with health authority personnel and inspectors and regulators. But one of the other things that um, we also have to do is we have to ensure that we have a, an intelligence role um, because it's the, the regulations and guidelines are changing all of the time. So we need to ensure that we're up to date so we can actually inform people making decisions, perhaps right at the beginning or even in the commercial space, that basically uh, this has changed and you need to change the way you do this. Um, so we need to make sure that we are up to date completely with the guidances and we need to know just to send them to the right people. OK, thank you very much. I think we can already see that this is a very wide ranging role with a lot of skills um, involved and a lot of things that people would need to think about before uh, before embarking on this career path. Um, we're going to look at routes into regulatory affairs now, and I suppose most of the people who come to us at the RSC to inquire about this type of career have already spent some time in the pharmaceutical industry, and they've maybe seen regulatory affairs professionals and admired what they do and thought, yes, that looks interesting. Um, but I guess that's one route in, and there are others. So if we just look at the next slide, I'm going to ask... Carol, uh, no, sorry, I'm going to ask Angela. If Angela will go through the first three bullet yeah. points on this slide, just explain how those routes in work. Okay, so it, myself, I started off as a bench chemist, as an analytical chemist. So I did a, a little bit of time within analytical chemistry before I went into regulatory affairs. Um, so there are routes in in that respect because once you once you have the CMC knowledge, and most of our chemistry people do have that knowledge. Um, it is quite easy then to move into uh, a regulatory career, although it won't be at the top of the regulatory ladder, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but there are different routes into regulatory science, and some of them um, directly after university. There are, in some cases, graduate schemes straight from university. They're few and far between, but they do exist. Um, there are also company intakes into what I would call a general pharmaceutical sciences role so that you might find a pharmaceutical company has graduate opportunities for one role and you then transfer from that role into another area. Um, certainly my company would take in, take in a, a 10 graduates per year and do that exact thing. Um, and as I said, there's a specialist role, so the CMC, the non-clinical and the clinical knowledge that you, you gather throughout um, other careers before that are generally quite transferable into the regulatory space. Um, so, you know, it's, it's 
not the easiest job to get into, but actually there are opportunities to do so. But I would expect that anybody um, would anybody wishing to go into this space would, would need to start and think, you know, what do I need to do to do this? So that you can show some aptitude for the job uh, when you go for an interview. Yeah, I guess that's all important, isn't it? Showing that um, it does sound like a very complex job. So I suppose having that enthusiasm for the role is going to really help if uh, if that's what you want to do. So thank you for that, Angela. Carol, um, you, you you told us about the bottom two bullet points on this slide, the sandwich students and secondment. So would you like to take us through those routes, please? Yes, I, I'm, I've got experience of both of these. Last year I had a, a sandwich student um, working with me and I think this tends to be very much the, the bigger companies that do this. They often have um, internships um, uh, available and um, GE does this on and off. It's not always continuous but some years they do take in a, an intake of interns. Um, they will advertise around the universities um, to, for prospective students and of course you know that those people won't have any um, previous experience so you tend to look for people that have got the right kind of um, personality to fit in with your company and also um, to, that, that are suitable for the regulatory environment but um, for, for something like that you don't need any experience. Um, this year I have someone working with me, she's on a year secondment, she came from our rec regulatory operations team who are responsible for um, making sure that everything that I do um, works smoothly and she didn't have any regulatory experience and she wants to break into regulatory and I took her on and in exchange for her helping me I, I'm training her as she goes along. So that's the, those are two other options that you might possibly have. OK, thank you very much. So, like I said, most of the people who talk to us at the RSC um, careers team are already in the pharmaceutical industry. But quite clearly, that is not the only route. There are other ways that you can that you can break into regulatory affairs, you know, right from university days. So I think during the course of this webinar, we're going to be talking about the kind of skills that you need on a day to day basis to do these jobs. So if at the moment you are studying or if you're thinking of a career change, I think listening to to, uh, to our panel today and thinking how many of those skills have I got how could I use the time that I've got at the moment to build up some of these skills in addition to my qualifications is uh, would probably be a good idea because clearly it is a very um, uh, complex job and a wide range of skills will be needed and I say that genuine enthusiasm for the role as well and the genuine enthusiasm for the other people that you're going to be coming across in a role such as this so thank you very much for that we're going to now look at what regulatory professionals do on a day-to-day -day basis. So a day in the life almost. Um, Angela, you, you sent us these points, um, things that you do in your role. Would you just like briefly to go through each of those for us? OK, so so regulatory professionals day is never the same from one day to the other. And that's what makes it so exciting. Um, one of the things that I do on in my role is is although I don't submit clinical trial applications um, and clinical trials, of course, are needed before you can do any uh, before you can license a drug. Although I don't personally put in clinical trial applications, we do have a group of regulatory people here who do. Um, and I'm probably more of the on the advisory side. And I basically advise us to what should be in a clinical trial package and, and somebody else goes away and, and, and does that. Um, and that's one of the ways actually just leaping back, one of the ways that a lot of people get into regulatory affairs is through the clinical study route where you become an expert in clinical trials. Um, the other one of the other things that I do on a day to day basis is, is because I have clients who come to me for advice, I'm advising them on their strategy for how they're going to actually um, have enough data at point X to actually write a dossier for the health authorities so that they can or so that they can um, apply for a, a marketing authorization. Um, as you said, marketing authorizations come in many shapes and flavors. There's actually uh, four ways in Europe to license a drug. Um, we all we, we, we call them by different names, decentralized, centralized, national, mutual recognition. But they're all essentially to do the same thing. They get you a marketing authorization for a drug. The interesting thing 
within that route is that there's a lot of strategy involved because actually it depends on where the customer wants to um, wants to sell their drug as to what strategy you you give what strategy you give. But there's also some mandatory things that say certain drugs have to go through a certain pathway, uh, and that's the type of thing we uh, we advise on. Another thing I do quite a lot is review data. So data comes in from clinical studies and we look at it and we say, is that answering the question that was asked? You know, is there a question uh, when you're putting together a marketing authorization, you may have a question that says, does this drug do what it says on the tin? And we would then review the data and say, well, yes, it does, or no, there's a gap here, and we need to fill that gap um, by doing another study or by, if it's a device, looking at maybe um, another way the device works, looking at the human factors involved, such as, you know, if you give a drug out of a syringe, uh, is that re repeatable in that novel syringe? I, if, if it's the same amount is, is dispensed by another person, is that actually repeatable? Um, and it's not sort of a human factor thing. Um, as I said, interpreting data is also very important. And we have to be able to then not only interpret that data, but also summarize that data to ensure that when we actually write a marketing authorization, um, we're actually getting the gist of what's required across. Um, we also advise, we advise an awful lot. We advise on, uh, for example, the classification of a medical device. We advise on um, the uh, pharmacovigilance requirements for drugs. Um, in essence, we come in at the start of a drug or a device's journey and we are out at the end. So we're the first in and the last out. And of course, that spans so much in the way of um, pharmaceutical development. We can be working with researchers one day and commercialization specialists and naming specialists the next um, and health technology assessment bodies as well. So, you know, we're right in the whole way through. So our job is um, different every day because we're interacting with so many different people every day. OK, thanks very much for that. And from what you've said as well, I mean, um, we always have to remember, of course, that the end recipient of this are going to be people, aren't they? You know, people who are maybe not very well, needing medication. And they are the people who uh, who, who you are. They're, 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 they're your ultimate customer, I guess. Absolutely. They, they absolutely are. And we always we always begin with that in mind. You know, you have to provide uh, confidence and you have to think about whether you would be confident giving that drug to your 95 year old great grandmother or something um, along the line or to your child um, you know it's it's very uh, it's very important that you always think about who the recipient of your product is yeah that's a very good point and yes I suppose that's a good way to think of it you know would you be happy giving this to a member of your family or a close friend so yes they're your ultimate customers um Carol sent us some points as well um Carol from your point of view <coughs> a day-to-day -day basis yeah I I'll try not to do too much repetition here because I think we've um uh, touched on quite a few of these things already, but um, I've already mentioned that you're acting very much as a as a, a liaison um, with regulatory agencies, and there's lots of opportunities there for um, influencing, um, presenting your information in a way that is impactful and that the um, regulatory will it help to answer the, the questions with the regulatory agencies they may have. Um, one thing that you have to be is very organised um, in producing the submissions. The submissions themselves are submitted in a, in a, a pre-specified um, format um, and, and this is organised in a way so that the agencies can digest this information and they can find what they're looking for very easily. And also all this is done to um, the codes which we call um, like the good clinical practice, good laboratory practice, good manufacturing practice, um, and making sure that your not just the that your drug is of the right quality, but also that the data that you're providing is of the right quality, and that is really important. Um, 
And also, as Angela's already mentioned, um, there's a, a degree of regulatory intelligence where you need to find out whether there's changes in, um, in requirements and to be able to translate that into a way that the, the scientist experts that you have within the company are actually working um, to, to meet those requirements. And um, often you're in an advisory role and this is really important um, for your company because if they're going to the great expense of generating data you have to make sure that what they have at the end is suitable for the purpose it answers the questions that the regulatory agencies are asking um, and um, if you do that at an early stage it means that you're not wasting um, all this valuable effort that you're putting into it Okay, thank you. And how would you describe a day in a day in your life, Carol, if that's possible? Um, well, <laughs> it's um, I, I, busy is probably an understatement, actually, because um, I, I think that there's a, a lot of um, organisation that has to go into the work that I do, and I will probably be I will have several projects on the go at any one time, and I have to keep those going forward. Um, and I, I will have quite a lot of people asking me questions um, and I will spend quite a lot of time asking other people questions as well because I need to understand what the issues are so that I, I can help um, you know my, my colleagues actually work towards a, 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 an output that will answer the questions that we have so it's just quite a lot of co a communication aspect I suppose is coming out of that yeah, yeah, and personal time management and personal organisation by the sound of it. Yeah. yeah, yes, very much so. We will go into the sort of essential transferable skills that uh, that are needed in a minute or two. But um, another question that we get asked by people considering a career um, in this field, uh, you know, how does your career progress? And I think I'm going to turn to Sinead now, who sent us a very interesting um progression route if I can get it up on the screen here there we go um, Sinead from from Topra would you like to take us through tell us a little bit about Topra for a start and maybe take us through uh, take us through this graphic Perfect, thank you. Um, so yes, TOPRA, um, as I mentioned, is uh, the regulatory affairs body um, for professionals in healthcare regulatory affairs across Europe and globally, actually. Um, we uh, are raising awareness about regulatory affairs and because it's not a very uh, well-known uh, profession, um, we have created a an infographic here which tries to explain how you can progress through your career and the different stages based on our member grades but also based on um, different areas where we link up our competency um, framework uh, titles. So really for anyone who's listening who is a student you would be in the first screen category where you're exploring um, so um, we cover courses that we theme as basics, we provide careers books just like the Royal Society of Chemistry with careers um, uh, coaching and consulting um, and e-learning and careers fair as well. If you're a professional who is already in, um, an, in employment um, but not specifically in regulatory affairs, then you would be more so in the establishing the orange sector there. Um, and that is where uh, people have about uh, up to two years experience um, really and our courses on foundation um, on the foundation theme um, are within that six months to two years bracket. Um, then we also have people who are uh, in mid-career. Uh, we provide courses um, that are called creds and then our master classes as well. And that is suitable for people with two to five years experience. Um, so as um, Angela and Carol have mentioned earlier, it is quite difficult to get your first job into regulatory affairs. Um, but once you do, um, uh, it is a very lucrative um, career to have. What we do is we try and provide at different stages of the career, um, we provide different learning support and training um, to suit the needs of, um, of the uh, stage that you are at. Um, so that's the, the highlight of um, 
of what we can do at, um, at Topra um, and how we segment all our uh, support and offering. Okay, thank you. Um, I think everybody's mentioned that maybe the most difficult bit is getting your first job in regulatory affairs to start with, Sinead. I mean, what sort of stories do you hear? Can you give us some case studies of people or people you know who've come in via many and varied routes? Yes, so um, there's a lot of uh, people who are members of both Topra and of RSC, um, so it's a perfect complement um, where people come from different disciplines. Uh, what we've been seeing a lot is, um, for example, through medical devices, people are looking for people with mechanical engineering skills or legal skills, um, chemistry skills, that's, you know, with your life science degree, that's your basic, uh, one of your basic uh, criteria for getting into regulatory affairs. Then it's all about the extra skills that you can build, um, communication skills, project management, and really having that interperson, uh, interpersonal skill set so that you could manage um, projects across continents, across different departments, um, and uh, remotely as well. Uh, we provide a, a jobs um, alerts um, well, and what I've been seeing a trend of is a lot of homeworking roles. Um, so, if uh, you know, if you're keen on on um, on a home-based role, or you know, just travelling um, once or twice a week um, as part of your your job, um, that could be an option too. Um, but what people are looking for is for in regulatory affairs, you, you have to stand out. Um, because there are so many science graduates um, coming out every year, it's about those extra skills. So what I always say to people is um, volunteering, your networking, get out there, meet people. Um, we've had volunteers at our annual conference who have um, gone on to uh, work with agencies. Um, so you have the medical agency in the UK, the MHRA. In Ireland, it's the HPRA. And then, you you know, across Europe and the globe, um, there are various agencies that you can get involved in. Um, and they're very good with developing your career. Um, so if you can't get a regulatory affairs job um, immediately, you could be in a supporting uh, department. Um, so learning about all the keywords, the um, the frameworks in, um, involved in the role of regulatory affairs, um, that can come from doing volunteering or um, from networking, um, attending conferences that are linked to regulatory affairs. Okay, that's great. So I, I think what you're all saying is that if this is something that you're interested in as a career, you actually need to be proactive. You know, you need to be getting out there. You need to be finding out what the skills are that you're going to need. You need to be demonstrating some enthusiasm. You need to be talking to the right people. Would that be a fair summation, do you think? Exactly. exactly right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. OK. So it's not going to come to you. This is one of these careers that's obviously very rewarding, um, but you have to show a real uh, a real thirst for wanting to do it, I would say, and, and do something positive for yourself to, to demonstrate that to potential employers. I mean, I guess for people who are already in the pharmaceutical industry, I mean, you know, are there such things as work shadowing opportunities, would you say, sort of Angela and Carol, do you yeah. have people shadowing yeah. you and that sort of thing? Yes, there certainly are. And, and I've had people shadow me who have come to me for a six week shadowing experience and have then gone on to actually pick up careers in regulatory affairs at fairly low level, but outside of the company, but have then built themselves up. And because they've got that little bit of uh, knowledge to start with, the, the um, employers are a little bit more um, uh, uh, happy to take them because they've already shown the initiative to actually mm. go in and and you know take that six weeks and and learn a little bit about what they're getting into and I think that's always a good way to do these things. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Carol? Not really. Well, there is one thing actually is um uh, uh, is when you're actually going for a job, even if you're not going for a regulatory job specifically, but it's something that you might want to do in the future, it's worth finding out at interview what um, 
what opportunities there are for moving around within the company. And my experience of um, working for very small companies is that you often become a bit of a jack of all trades because yeah. you don't often you don't have enough people to have dedicated roles and they do a bit of this and that. And sometimes if you can get into a small company, you may well get some experience by doing that just because they don't have somebody specifically to do that work and you may end up doing a bit of it anyway and it's an excellent way of getting some experience which can go onto your cv and perhaps it can help you get your next job all right that's great advice thank you so and i think another thing that's coming out here sinead's already mentioned it explicitly is um, the whole um, importance of networking as well of knowing people um, because i expect a lot of these opportunities to to demonstrate your your interest would would come through a network and i know certainly being a member of a professional body like the Royal Society of Chemistry or TOPRA can really help you to make those connections. And Sinead and I will talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the webinar. But if we could move on now, um, we've talked about um, a day in the life of a regulatory affairs professional. Um, let's go into the skills that you actually need, um, the sort of things, the skills that you're using on a day to day basis. So, Angela, um, th these came from you. Would you like to take us through this? Yeah, so, so the first essential skill I would say is some sort of scientific background. You need to be able to understand a product um, to be able to create credibility with a project team. So you really need to have a, a scientific time background that can actually assimilate the data. And that doesn't mean that you have to have um, you know, a degree in medicine or something like that, but but something around that scientific that shows that you have the ability to actually to to pick it up and and summarize it. And if you can summarize it and tell somebody else, then basically that's one of the essential skills. Um, you need to be able to express the complex issues really succinctly and clearly. You need to be able to explain to perhaps somebody that isn't quite understanding, or maybe even a regulator, exactly. Um, where, where you're coming from, or maybe it's a guideline that you've read and you need to be able to tell commercial, the commercial team that, you know what, they can't do what they're doing, they have to do it a different way. Um, you have to be able to look at the regulations and guidelines and apply them, interpret them and apply them. One of my, one of the first people I worked with in regulatory affairs told me something that I've never ever forgotten and that is, you, can ha you have to be able to read and understand the regulations, but then you have to be able to think of a way to get to the same point with the same information, but actually not perhaps following them to the letter. So it's all about interpretation of those regulations to ensure that you're not wasting money, to ensure that you're getting to the point you need to be at in the quickest possible way. How can you actually do things in parallel? Um, so it's not only about being able to read the regulations and guidelines and knowing where to go, but it's actually how you apply those to your product. You need to have an open mind. This is very, very important. Um, everything changes all of the time. People have different ideas. And you know, if you go into a meeting with your peers and you have a set definition of this is how it has to be done, that won't work. You need to have an open mind to listen to other people and work with them and be flexible and adaptable to work around a problem rather than just say, no, the regulations say X and that is the way it has to be done. That's not how a good regulatory affairs professional operates. Um, you have to be very, very much into doing your continuing professional development. Uh, regulations and guidelines change every single day. And certainly this is something that um, I always allow my staff, and I actually question my staff if I don't see on their um, on their the work they've done, if I don't see that they've spent some time looking at new guidances, looking at how things are changing within the regulatory framework throughout the world. And I always question them as to why they haven't spent that time, because it really is very, very important. Um, within TOPRA, we actually say to be a member of TOPRA, you must do 50 hours of continuing professional development, or we suggest that you should do 50 hours. 50 hours really isn't very much, and 50, 50 hours doesn't mean that you're sitting reading guidelines or going on courses. What it means is you're actually assimilating new data, and, and that could even be from a television documentary or something similar. 
as I say, you have to be flexible and you have to adapt. And you also have to have a collaborative spirit. It's a very, very important thing. Um, you know, you're going to deal with a lot of people from a lot of different or different areas of a business, from marketeers who are generally the very dynamic, outgoing, alpha male type uh, people, to the more introvert and conservative people who, you know, you often see in the research organizations, um, you know, stereotyping a little bit, but you must be able to um, collaborate and work with all of those people um, and, and and also sort of think about the fact that you know these people have different needs and these people need to be treated in a slightly different way to get the best out of them. Um, one of the biggest skills is project management. Um, as Carol's already alluded to, we don't work on one project at a time. It would be amazing if we did. I myself have just added up this morning. I think I've got 24 projects ongoing. Now, clearly, I'm not looking at every single one of those every day, but I need to know where I am on each of those projects. Um, so managing your time, managing what you're doing, because we are so busy all of the time, is very, very important. And then the last thing I would say, um, and this sounds a bit bizarre, but you really do need to have a rechargeable battery. There are times when we are working very long hours, doing lots of um, very tedious work or very, very um, time consuming work. And the time just seems to go, but we've got a deadline and we have to work to that. And those deadlines are not artificial deadlines sometimes. They are deadlines that basically have been set by regulators to perhaps answer questions or perhaps to get responses back to them. So you may find yourself within the organi within your organization in regulatory affairs doing some long hours sometimes. And it's very important that you can get your head down, get some sleep, and then you're ready to start again. Now, clearly, as in any job, you then have some slacker times when you can actually take a little bit of that time back, and that's always a good thing. But it isn't, it isn't a walk in the park all the time. And I think that's important to know. It is a very highly pressurized job at times but it's also incredibly rewarding. Um, and one of the biggest rewards for me is when you go into a pharmacy and you see on a shelf a product that you've actually worked on and now it's on the, on the market in the pharmacy shelf and actually people are actually um, being treated with that product and it's saving lives. Um, and for me, that is really, really rewarding. Oh, I can understand that completely. I mean, that, that's a really valuable insight. And certainly the, the CPD bit we'll probably come back to um, when we look at the support that you can get from both TOPRA and the RSC, because CPD, you know, is very, is extremely important in all scientific careers. But I would think in regulatory affairs, it's absolutely essential. So thank you very much for that, Carol. Um, we have some more essential skills. Angela, sorry, we have some more essential <laughs> skills from from Carol. I do beg you, do beg your pardon. So, Carol, would you like to take us through your your list of what you find to be essential in your day to day work? Yes, I think when I when I wrote this, I was thinking about the kind of person that you needed to be to um, get yeah. on with this kind of work, yeah. and I put at the top of the list as being a self starter. Um, and by that, I was thinking that really need to be somebody that doesn't mind trying things you don't feel 100% confident about and being able to um, think find your own solutions to problems that you have um, and, and generally to sort of take ownership of the projects that you work for you, you need you're working on sorry and to be able to push those forward you also need an eye for detail and that operates whether you're actually putting together submissions or whether you're working at the strategy level you need to be able to try and think about everything that might happen and um and really sort of get get to down to all the issues that matter when when you're working on a particular project and one of the things that i think probably all of us have learned at some stage is if, if there is something, if you if you ignore it, it often come back comes back and bites you later on. So you need to um, you need to be the kind of person that can think about um, all all the issues that are involved with a particular project. And I think that a big part of my job as well is the influencing and the ne negotiation side of it. And 
the, I think probably the most important thing is when people come to you with a, with a question, whether it's something that comes from your colleagues or whether it's from an agency, is that you really have to have good listening skills and really understanding what the question is, because if you don't listen and, and really understand what it is that the other person needs, you're not going to be able to give them a good answer. So that kind of, it, uh, kind of thing is really important. And, and that's a big part to do with um, your communications being persuasive, whether it's that you're persuading the agency that, um, that the data that you're giving them meets what their requirements, or whether it's getting colleagues on board to help you so that you can go back to the agency. And also the other thing is, is that you must be a clear uh, communicator on paper as well. And often you're dealing with multidisciplinary teams. <clears throat> you're not just dealing with agencies, you're also dealing with scientists, and you may be dealing with your commercial colleagues um, and all of those people have um, very different needs and as as you have a, a coordinating role um, you're often providing information to people that don't have a technical background so you need to be fairly, fairly sort of flexible in your communication style <clears throat> It's also very important that you're able to drive your projects forward and very often as a regulatory person you end up having a kind of um, project management role where although it's it's a project that belongs to someone else you end up being the person that is having to drive it. <clears throat> We've already talked about project management skills you need you often have several projects on the go and they all need to be mo moved forwards. Um, and quite often you, the, there's a high problem solving aspect to the job. And this is probably the, the thing that I like most. I actually quite like it when something's gone wrong and somebody comes to me and says, Carol, hey, we're not quite sure what to do with this. We don't know how to put this right. And I quite enjoy all the investigation side of it and um, f coming up with a solution. So if you're good at problem solving, then you will be loved in, in regulatory. And most of important, most important is also the team working skills. You must be able to get on with all kinds of people. Um, obviously, you won't get on with all of them all the time, but you do need to you know, have a working relationship with these people to make sure that you can all work together as a team and, and come up with the, the solution at the end. That's great. I hope that gives you a bit of an idea oh. of this kind of person that you need to be. Yes, it does indeed. And thank you very much for that. Um, I hope um, you're all taking notes here. If you think this is going to be a career for you and thinking about what sort of skills you can start developing now, whether you're a student at university or whether you're doing another kind of job that would actually be useful as evidence of these sort of skills that you would need if you want to move into regulatory work. Now, um, we're going to move on to the support that's available from TOPRA and from the Royal Society of Chemistry, which Sinead and I are going to take you through. But I would say if you've got any questions at this point, while we're going through this next slide, if you'd like to type them, we've got one question that's coming already, which we'll deal with in a second or two. But while Sinead and I go through what support there is available, please feel free to type in questions for, for any of us and we will attempt to answer them. So support from TOPRA and the RSC. Um, Sinead, do you want to kick off and tell us um, tell us what TOPRA can do for its members? Sure. So uh, we support over three and a half thousand members um, across over 55 countries now. Um, we have 40 years of experience of providing regulatory affairs training, so we have a, a strong reputation. Um, but as a professional body, what we pride ourselves on is that we are a neutral forum, so we um, are not um, uh, linked to any uh, corporate companies. We uh, support members as an individual, so the membership stays with the individual no matter what job they're in, or even if they're not in a job. Um, we also provide a half hour uh, career coaching session for every member um, through our careers consultant. Um, but also, I think what's really important um, on, on this session is to talk about the volunteering. Um, and as I said before, you know, I have heard a lot of um, student members have progressed on into um, very juicy regulatory affairs roles after volunteering with TOPRA and other organisations. Um, or submitting posters, um, scientific posters. So, for example, at our annual symposium, we have a poster competition. 
Um, and with the volunteering, um, what we find is that people are learning from more experienced members. So we have a lot of member networks. Um, so we call our special interest network SPINs and we call our territory based member networks TOPRA INS. And with that, I encourage younger professionals or new prof um, professionals to regulatory affairs to join those groups um, and to support the chair and the secretary um, to run activities such as networking events or free webinars or um, provide, um, contributing articles to our uh, academic journal. Um, so volunteering, learning new skills, learning from people who have done the job, who have um, been there and done that for years, um, is definitely something that will add value to your CV. Um, uh, with the networking as well, um, we have, and, and the same with RSC, lots of opportunities to network and, and careers events um, so I would encourage all listeners to attend those. Um, our website has a whole list of courses, topper.org forward slash courses, which includes networking and training um, programs. And with the professional development, um, as you had said, Julie, about CPD, how important that is. If you have no experience in regulatory affairs, um, you can just become a standard member. It's a registered member, which Angela was referring to, we highly recommend, or you must, um, in order to receive your MTOPRA letters, you must um, collect up to 50 hours of CPD um, per year. And how we help um, individuals with that is we have a CPD recorder tool online, um, and we give examples of different ways that people can collect CPD points. So for example, you could read the journal and collect CPD points, attend a course or, um, things like that. Um, but also we have a competency framework which highlights all the um, essential skills as part of your uh, regulatory affairs career and that's also available online um, or you can pop me a message afterwards or through the careers um, email through uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry as well. Um, and that's really it in a quick summary. OK, thanks, Sinead. I mean, what the RSC does is very similar. As we say, you know, we've got a lot of members in common. Um, we do have a, we do have a mentoring program, a voluntary mentoring program. We can offer mentors for RSC members if you feel that that would be useful. And these are very often useful to help you develop some of these transferable skills that we've been talking about during this webinar. Uh, we've certainly got huge networking opportunities. You know, we've got nine divisions and over 70 special interest groups and and there are lots of ways for you to get to know other people who are working in the field that interests you in pharmaceuticals, whatever it might be. So if you are a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry, I would say go on to our website, find out what networking opportunities there are. And if you're a member, get your money's worth out of us. You know, that's what we're there for. We, too, have a professional development framework. Um, anyone who is a chartered chemist, um, CPD is mandatory for them. And it's against a framework of competencies, much the same as TOPRA. So, again, it gets you into good habits of thinking how you're maintaining and developing your skills. Um, the careers team, um, of which I am one, if you've got any questions for us on any aspect of managing your career, there is our email there, careers at rsc.org. You're very welcome to email us. And we've got a lot of information on our website, too, which is www.rsc.org forward slash careers. OK, so let's can I move. sorry. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes. I was, I was just going to say on the on the mentoring piece, I, I just want to point out um, mm -hmm. I have had a mentor from the RSC for a number of years, um, well over 20 years. And, you know, I found it to be invaluable. Um, he doesn't work in regulatory affairs. He works as a, as a chemist, um, but he has ex experiences that I required, such as HR experiences, staff development experiences and how to get the best out of people. And I've really appreciated that. And I think that's an absolute essential piece, to be honest. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, we're expanding our mentoring opportunities now. So anyone who feels that that would be um, useful for them, uh, please do get in touch with us. Just use that email that's on the screen there.
OK, we've had a question that's come in from a listener. Um, someone is saying, I've graduated with an MSc in pharmaceutical sciences and regulatory affairs, and I've worked for a large company for nearly two years. And I want to route to regulatory affairs from QA. What would be the best option, please? Who, who'd like to answer that one? Stunning. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so, sorry. sorry. Yeah, it's OK. Who, who, who's going to answer that one? I'll, I'll let Angela go first. OK. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so from, from my point of view, um, moving from QA to regulatory, actually, there's a lot of similarities there within the job. Um, I would say that probably you want to then now look at a job in because I imagine it's QA with respect, is this QA with respect to uh, labs or is this QA with respect to clinical studies? Um, but, you know, whatever, the QA analytical mind is a good mind to actually move into maybe moving forward to a clinical trial type role now. Um, which you can then build on. And as we've already said, in the smaller organizations, if you go in in like a clinical trial role, actually you soon find out that you're not only doing clinical trials, you're actually moving through uh, and doing other things as well. And the other option is to move to a contract research organization. Um, and they also, you know, somebody with a QA background would be very useful in this sort of clinical trial sort of environment. Um, and then, as I say, you then move through again. Okay, thank you for that. We have another question that's come in saying, someone is saying, I've worked at two large companies for a couple of years as a pharmaceutical analyst, bench chemist, as well as a data analyst at a pharma company in London for about a year. I went on to work for the pharmacy and pharmaceutical department at a university as a researcher for over a year, and I went on to study pharmacy and did my pre-registration year within a hospital for a year. I'm now a pharmacist. Due to personal issues, I've not practiced as a pharmacist full time since December 2016. What level would I start at and what type of role would be suitable for me? So who'd like to take that one? Carol, would you like to have a go at that as Angela answered the last one? Yeah, I was just trying to think about what level that you would come in at with that. I think that actually if you have pharmacy experience, that can be absolutely fantastic if you're working on the chemistry and pharmacy side of dossiers. Um, and it's often a, a sought after skill. I mean, I know some pharmacists actually, um, they almost um, think of uh, people that in other areas as being semi-professionals when it comes to working in the pharmaceutical industry. And I say that slightly tongue in cheek, but I think that that is um, a very good area to be um, proficient in. Um, I'm afraid I can't give much advice on what level you might be coming in at, though. I think it would depend on what kind of jobs that you're going for. I mean, certainly speak to recruiters as well, because um, they may be able to give some help with that. Um, of which, if, you, if you're any in any kind of full time jobs and you're on LinkedIn, you usually get more calls from those than um, than actually that you 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 welcome. So. Um, if, if you do get any calls from recruiters, use the opportunity to pump them. Don't just let them uh, be um, be questioning you. Is, is what I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just say you should really be looking to come in at at an associate level um, on the sort of like uh, uh, not 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 at the beginning of the foundation, but perhaps towards the end of what we would call a foundation level, moving more into the the uh, the establishing um, area because within the pharmacy degree you should also have done some um, some legal work which is basically what um, one of the skills that you need for um, regulatory affairs anyway so uh, you know I think you've got a good transferable set of skills there and I think uh, you know I, I would definitely advise you as Carol has to talk to recruiters because they will find somewhere and there are a lot of jobs out there um, at that level 
um, the jobs that are really lacking are the ones where you've just come out of university and have no experience at all in the pharmaceutical industry or in pharmacy, or the ones right at the top end, um, which obviously, you know, there, there's only one chief usually, so um, there's always going to be a lack of jobs there. Okay, thanks very much. We're running out of time. A couple of other quick questions. Someone is asking for a brief list of networking groups or seminars. Well, I think probably the best thing to do will be to go to the RSC's websites for that. And the TOPRA website, Sinead, would yours all be listed on there? Yes, indeed. And also, um, we have a large um, TOPRA LinkedIn group as well. And there are a number of different groups on LinkedIn in, um, to keep up to date um, on the um, roles that are available. If anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, they can. I have a number of recruitment um, consultants who follow us. Um, and we also carried out a salary survey last year. So if you're interested in finding about, out about the salary ranges, um, average starting, you know, £30,000, um, but senior management level from £120,000 um, if you're based in the UK. Um, obviously depends on the role and the company, uh, but that's an interesting read as well. Um, and that's free to download on our website. OK, thank you. Another quick question here. Someone is asking, <coughs> what, is, what is a regulatory rapporteur? Oh, the regulatory rapporteur is our yeah. flagship journal. That's what, oh. uh, a rapporteur, though, a rapporteur in the sense of licensing drugs. Um, we have uh, rapporteurs and co-rapporteurs and they're health authority people who are involved in the assessment of uh, drugs and devices, uh, drugs particularly, but devices with, with medicinal product, uh, medicinal product attached when we actually go for an MAA or, or a CE mark for a device. So a rapporteur in the sense of a, a regulatory understanding is, is basically the lead assessor for the drug within the European Union. The co-rapporteur would be the second assessor. And then the other, um, the other uh, agencies basically um, uh, feed in as well, but they aren't the lead or the, the second assessor. So it's... Uh, in, in that respect, um, that's a rapporteur, but the regulatory rapporteur is our flagship journal. OK, that's wonderful. A very quick answer to this one, and then we're going to have to wrap up. I've worked in consumer goods regulatory affairs, primarily on chemical regulations for the last two and a half years following graduation. And I'm considering switching to pharma regulatory affairs. What will be a good route to facilitate this and what sort of opportunities should I look out for? Could someone take that very quickly? Okay, so consumer would be the sort of OTC um, type products, I'm presuming. Um, and, and I think, or, or even um, um, sh shampoos and, and that sort of thing. So there are routes from there into uh, drug registration. I would say, again, the best thing is to contract, contact some of the recruiters and tell them where you want to go, because they will then have uh, be able to put your CV in front of um, um, companies who will then be able to say, you know, we can actually take that person because they have this skill, this skill and this skill. And I would guess that the, the general route is from there is to work on uh, OTC products and pharmacy products and then move up to the, POM, the, the prescription only products. OK, thank you very much. Right. We have run out of time. I'm just going to ask Sinead. Um, there's a wonderful opportunity here for anyone who's listened to this webinar and want to find out more to come and find out in person. So, Sinead, you just quickly want to tell us about your careers event that's coming up? Yes, exactly. And also to follow up on, on um, Angela's answer there, um, if you would like to meet potential employers, um, we have our very successful regulatory careers fair happening in London again on the 30th of April. And what we do is we set up um, the opportunity for you to meet people from agency, from industry and from consultancies to give their own stories just like Angela and Carl have today um, but also we'll, um, we will have uh, a lot of companies there who are wanting um, graduates from uh, from universities but also people who are already established so um, chemistry could be one of those areas. Um, the other thing to highlight is um, to uh, encourage anyone who's listening to read up about the UK Apprenticeship Scheme. Um, TOPRA is signed up to that now and we'll be uh, running a session on that. Um, and that may also be an alternative route for some of you.
um, if you've not uh, completed university. Um, so that's happening on the 30th of April um, and you can come along and meet uh, members and uh, recruiters and agency consultancy staff as well. There's also one happening in Dublin on the 6th of June if anyone wants to, to Dublin. OK, definitely some dates for the diary there. Thank you very much, Sinead. Um, that finishes what we've got to talk about today. I would uh, just like to thank you all for listening and encourage you to get in touch careers at rsc.org if there's anything that you'd like to know or if we can help you in any way. And it just remains for me really to thank very much our, our illustrious panel today who have been uh, absolutely great with information and hints and tips. So thank you very much, Sinead Whelan, who is head of membership for Topra. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great talking to you. Thank you, Angela Stokes. And also thank you, thank you. Carol Preston. It's been a great session and thank you all very much. Listen, Welcome. All the best of luck if you decide to, uh, to pursue this route. So thank you all and goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.